thank you, Lloyd Best Institute, for this opportunity to share. Um, permaculture, you all um, can guess what it means, where the word comes from, how it, how it comes about. Any suggestion? Can we make this interactive? Right, permanent. That's right. It's interesting for me personally because I used to say permanent was a synonym for toxic. We live on a planet where the transformation of energy from sunlight to plants to animals to decomposers and round and round is how this system functions. Constant transformation of energy. When men, when human beings create chemicals that nature has never come across, that they do not change, things like PCBs, things like plastic, these permanent things are intrinsically dangerous and unhealthy to the planet. This plastic, I use um, punch and rum plastic for my water. I assume if it can withstand ethanol, it should not be leaching too much plastic into my um, water. Not too close. Sorry. Is that about right? Good. So yes, um, plastic is a permanent thing, relatively permanent, thousands of years and it's inherently toxic. So permanent, when it comes to culture, has to mean adaptable. It has to be able to change. It has to be able to move on its feet. So this is what permaculture is about. It's about adapting to climate change. It's about having a wide selection of techniques and resources to pull from, to, to, to come up with solutions to the ever-changing situation. So it came about in the early 70s, 1972, there was a publication called The Limits to Growth. And this inspired Bill Mollison to go back to basics and to develop a system based on ecological principles, which came to be known as permaculture. Limits to Growth was a document um, that basically used the early computers um, to come up with systems analysis where they could plug in data from all different sources. And they were plotting resource depletion as opposed to population growth. And they were able to predict that around now, we would be running into resource limits. And I assume everybody here in this room now has heard the phrase peak oil. The um, five years that I've been teaching permaculture, the first time I mentioned that word, nobody had ever heard of it. But permaculture has been talking about it since the 70s. But peak oil is upon us. We're at, at the plateau now. And it means that the energy that was created, the Industrial Revolution, um, is going to be less and less and more expensive um, from here on in. That's inevitable and that it may be that the industrial model is over. Um, we've been saying that as permaculturalists for a long time. It was never sustainable. Um, all the alternative fuels, are none of them can meet the kind of return um, as, as liquid fuels as petroleum. So we're not going to be able to continue this model um, as we know it. So the definition for permaculture is a land use. It's a holistic land use and community building movement that is in the business of designing productive landscapes for humans using ecological principles that integrate with natural systems. By using nature's laws, we create, we design landscapes that have the resilience and the biodiversity of natural systems. And so I'm going to now just give you a series of, of um, concepts, ideas that um, are specific to our um, region. But first, I'd like to actually, uh, it came to me during the talk here, is that um, we're talking about the common sense uh, convoi. And what does the word ecological mean? Do we know what the Greek word eco where it comes from, what does it mean? Anybody? Home. 
Eco means home. So what does ecological mean? It means home sense. And what that comes down to is that we all live in an ecosystem, a particular ecosystem, different from everybody else's ecosystem unless we're immediate neighbors. We all live in a particular watershed. Everybody lives in a watershed. If you all, you all understand that idea, that we all live in a watershed. And watersheds nest one within the other. And a new term maybe to some people, we all live in a bioregion or life place. The scientists call it an eco-zone, but they don't include humans. But a bioregion is the human interaction with the smallest land area that a community can be self-sufficient. That is your bioregion. And our bioregion is the Orinoco watershed. We are in the delta of the Orinoco. All the species that inhabit our land have come down in the floods and over time, our, we are intrinsically part of the Orinoco. So we're talking about political changes in order to make ourselves self-sufficient and able to create sustainable societies that we have to integrate with cultures that have lived in the Orinoco for thousands of years. They know all the relationships of all the species, what animals eat what plants, and all the times that they breed, and all the information that we need to understand the appropriate relationships for our ecosystem. Yeah, um, in Venezuela, yes. Um, it's close enough that there would be similarities, but the Orinoco is our specific bioregion. It's the minimum land mass, land area, that we could have a completely sustainable culture. We would have everything we needed for life. We would not need to export anything region, um, outside of the region. And this includes the whole Caribbean archipelago. It would, be, it would connect back to the Yucatan Peninsula um, from um, Cuba and Jamaica. So this is our bioregion, and this is the thinking of permaculture is that we need to learn how to live correctly, appropriately in this place with all our relations. There are particular species that we share this bioregion with, and there's, if you over-harvest one prey species one season, you're going to go without the next season. There's a long-term balance. We're in dynamic equilibrium. But this is the, the um, place where we are, where we find ourselves. So towards food sovereignty with perennial polyculture. I use the word sovereignty as opposed to security because it has to do with what's appropriate again. We have a diet based on European and um, the Indian um, culture. The fact of the matter is, macaroni pie is not sustainable. Wheat and dairy are not going to be grown in our region unless climate change really um, turns us upside down. Um, and the other um, source of our um, cuisine, chana and split peas, is not sustainable. Those are temperate climate food. So we have to look at the indigenous food and or tropical um, cuisine. The other thing that permaculture promotes is that we form relationships with other nations around the tropical belt that have similar climate to us presently and similar geography and start to share species. I have on the table three um, species that the permaculturalists have introduced to Trinidad. One is chaya from Central America, which is an edible pot herb that you do have to cook before you can eat it. Um, the two others, one is ibica, the other one is katuk. They're both from Indonesia, and they can be eaten raw, or they can be put in soups, they can be cooked. Um, but the ibica is particularly good. It is a family to okro. It looks like an okro, but you eat the leaf and not the fruit. The fruit is, um, there's not very much to the fruit, but the leaf is very pleasant tasting. And it has the same mucilaginous um, taste as okro. So you can make a raw kalaloo um, by blending ibica. Um, so food sovereignty is about 
eating what's appropriate to your region. Um, and in terms of becoming one with your bioregion, the first thing we need to do is to map our watershed. We need to come together in our villages, in our neighborhoods, in our community groups, and start to map our watersheds in terms of all the different species that we share our watersheds with. You know, If you live in a particular ecosystem, it means that the kiskidi that comes through your yard is not the same kiskidi that comes through somebody else's yard in the next valley over. You live in a particular ecosystem with a particular set of, of, of animals and plants that are literally, that is their home, that they are restricted to that area to a large extent, except where there is migration um, seasonally as well as internationally. We want to envision self-sufficiency for our watersheds. We want to come together as groups, form ourselves into community-based organizations. There are government programs that they're going to give you um, support. You come together and com we come together in community-based organizations and we start to do this work of analyzing what are our natural resources, our human talent resources um, that we have in our watersheds and start to work to go towards envisioning self-sufficient communities, communities that do not require a large ecological footprint in order to be able to survive the, the, the changes that are, that are coming in climate and so on. So for example, um, we look at the Karani lands that are, that are being given out. Instead of them being given out to individual farmers, it would make a lot more sense to create villages and hamlets where groups of people form into cooperatives that, and the suggestion has been made by earlier speakers that, you know, if, and it has, and has happened in the past, I think you mentioned a model where families got together and, and shared in their thinking around. So the, the idea is that you feed yourself first and then you share surplus. That is the, the goal of permaculture. Um, but the reality is, is that f uh, if the smallest unit of a human population is not the nuclear family. A nuclear family cannot um, survive on its own. The smallest population is a community and a tribe, a sort of a, a tribal um, um, relationship where all for one and one for all. Give support, get support. This is the economy of hunter-gatherers. Everybody was born into a, a tribe where they received lifetime support and respect. And we need to recreate these models within our communities, within our neighborhoods, amongst the people who we live side by side. We have to overcome our religious and ethnic differences and be able to start work in order to repair and regenerate the ecosystems that we live in. That is, that is the goal of bioregionalism and permaculture. So having mapped our watersheds, we need to start clearing fire traces as groups and families and communities, clearing fire traces to start to stop the fires. I put this at the top of the list where no matter where you are in Trinidad, get together with your neighbors and organize to start protecting the land from fire. This is so crucial, it doesn't, you know, it, it does, I, can, you know it is, I put it at the top of the list, that the flooding that we are getting is a result of the fires, that we are losing canopy on the ridges. Well, we lost canopy in the central, took sugarcane decades ago, but the reality is if we start to fire trace those cane fields, we can start to allow forests to regenerate and start to plant fruit trees in, in those natural forests. In, in, in the natural succession, we actually then start to put in biodiversity, things that we need for human um, consumption. Um, all right. So when you're clearing fire traces, you're generating mulch. This is fertilizer. How does a forest look after itself? It does, zero waste. It recycles everything. So the next thing is to dig swales. People might not have heard of swales. If I say contour drains, you might understand what I mean. It's a channel or a ditch that's dug using an A-frame on contour, so it traps the water at whatever level you dig the contour, and the water is forced to infiltrate. This causes aquifers to recharge, 
and it causes water to start to be held in the soil, which is one of the most important places to store water, is actually in the soil. Plant pioneer and nitrogen fixing species, Boacano, Boaflo, Jennifer, Jamun, Hog Plum, Poidu, Pigeon Peas, Green Fig, Banana, Plantain, Popo, Cassava, Edo, Sweet Potato, Tanya, all on contour. Plant, plant trees on contour, it helps to hold the soil. And by planting this multitude of different crops, it means that we always have something to reap. We're planting for the short term, the medium term, and the long term at the same time. In permaculture, we call it a guild. The short-term crops are coming um, at the lowest level. It's the, the, the Euro what I like to call the European weeds, the lettuce, pak choy, and cabbage, and so on. And then you have your, your peppers and your melangen, and then you have your pigeon peas, and you're, you're, you're stacking um, in height as well as in space. And so you have um, all the land covered, and you have the big trees planted in there, they're being minded while you mine the garden, and everything coming at the same time. And you have something to reap, you have a continuous yield. That is the goal of permaculture, is to have a yield as soon as possible, and then to have a continuous yield. It means you're not dependent on a monocrop, that if the weather changes, you lose the whole thing. It means you always have something to reap. This is the vision. We need to reinforce the ridges. And another very important thing is to plant trees on the riverbanks. This thing about dredging riverbanks is a total waste of resources. It is causing the silt to, to go into the swamps and destroy the life in the swamps, with all that excess silt going into the swamps. What needs to happen is that there needs to be at least a 100-foot band on every riverbank throughout Trinidad that is allowed to go back to nature. And this will actually cause the water to flow. The trees will suck up excess water, and they will prevent the grass from growing, which clogs up the rivers. This is a natural phenomenon that we constantly fight um, all the time with our um, wrong-headed thinking. And then the la I'll just throw out the, the last thing. You control bachak by taking bachak from one nest and putting it in another nest. <laughs> we all need to compost. Compost is not an option. Compost is essential. That, I'm sorry, is the, again the bottom line. And those cattle that they slaughtered down in um, Cedros recently, I hope it ended up on the market, but even if it didn't, we need to be corralling those, those cattle and minding them and milking them. We need to have free-range grass-fed animals, livestock in this country in order to have organic manure for the organic gardens that we need to depend on. We need to be able to recycle nutrients. We have those cows, we have those goats, we have those sheep here. They, didn't, they weren't indigenous, but they've been naturalized. The Jamaicans have done a lot of good work on interbreeding cattle so that they have tropical blood in them as well, the zebu, and so on. These are the things that we need to be doing. And then the last thing is the suburban bread basket. As somebody mentioned before, all of suburbia, the east-west corridor, is on the A-class soils, the A1 soils. We need to have people planting kitchen gardens in those soils they could actually supply all the needs of the east-west corridor. We don't need to have um, that separation between farm and town, that we need to actually be planting those gardens. The other thing is, talking about two minutes exercise every, every day, we all need to spend 15 minutes a day in nature being quiet, using our peripheral vision, listening, smelling, tasting, touching, Unless we start to do this work, everybody, individually, we are not going to find ourselves in a sustainable culture. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. And there's a lot of...